Uh, so welcome, welcome to the 50-something people on Zoom as well. Um, I'm very happy to start this, uh, this week of uh, open source themed uh, lectures. And the first speaker we have today is Carlo Piana. He's a lawyer uh, with extensive experience on, on free and open source software related actions. He's been uh, um, a counsel to the Free Software Foundation Europe for um, 10 years, now a member of the board of the Open Source Initiative. And I'm very happy where we can have Carlo here today to, to give uh, this introduction to our lecture series. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. We are starting with probably one of the most challenging for non-lawyers uh, subject for, of course, because many people know the, the part of uh, the, the, the philosophical part of open source uh, or the technical part of open source. Many have some concept on the legal aspects, but uh, a little bit of knowledge is much worse than having no knowledge at all because it becomes dangerous. So what I am going to present today is a quite dense, quite packed uh, set of information, but it's a minimum set to be reasonably confident to be uh, able to manage the concepts of open source, to be leading or starting a, an open source project from uh, deciding to do it, from the licensing, how to publish, what to use, what uh, frameworks, what libraries, and so on and so forth. So uh, I've on already been introduced. This is my uh, short bio, and I'm not much of a publisher, of a, uh, of a scholar. I'm done, I've written this book in, uh, in, in Italian. Uh, there are contributions of mine in, in books uh, in, in many places, but not. Uh, uh, today, uh, we are learning, as, as I said, quite a lot of things, and I, I'm not going to read it. Uh, you will find it in the material if you go uh, after uh, this one hour. You can go and, s and look if you have learned all of these things. Uh, it's, it's going to be, oh, it should go, sorry. It should go down, and it doesn't. There's a, there's a, the, the, the slides are, are already online if you want to, to browse them. And uh, this is the, 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 the kind of things that after the lesson you can uh, go and see, oh, no, uh, we have missing, oh, all is this. So it all starts with copyright. Uh, we have this uh, system, which, by the way, is governed by a, um, a, a convention which was made in, in, uh, in Bern more than 100 years ago. Um, copyright is an exclusionary right. It's a right doesn't exist in nature. It, it's created by the law, and it gives you the right to exclude others from doing certain things. So, because the, the law gives you these exclusionary rights, it's a negative right. All the IP or so-called IP rights are negative. They are right to prohibit. By the right to prohibit, you can demand things in exchange of the permission. So this is, in a nutshell, how copyright works. So uh, when, when we say this thing is mine, means that the, the law gives me one or more rights on the same artifact, the same uh, subject matter. So uh, actually, using the word uh, intellectual property is, uh, is, is a wrong wording because it conveys something which belongs to physical objects, not to intellectual production, intellectual concept, ideas, uh, intellectual artifact, non-tangible things, which can, can, cannot be consumed. If I have an idea, you can have an idea. This is the, the, old, the old routine. So the, the, the law introduces scarcity, and through scarcity, control, and to control, it's a leverage to obtain other things. As I said, it's within the, the framework. It's one of the probably the most internationalized set of rules, copyright, because it, it exists virtually in any country of the world, at least in the most meaningful ones. 
So uh, in more than 100 states, or no, 190 states are belongs to the Berne Convention. So the same right is obtained in one of the states, it's obtained through all the entire union. So, so you get the right in Switzerland, you are protected everywhere without doing anything. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a right that is obtained by creation, by fixation and publication, by, actually by fixation. So uh, if my speech is uh, recorded, this is a subject, uh, a copyrighted subject matter because it's been fixed. There is no claim, no formal application. You don't have to apply. You don't have to have permission. You can be, you can even be a minor of age, and that it's sufficient to, for you to create uh, copyright. So no special, uh, no special uh, uh, status. So. Uh, the only thing you need is to create something, sorry, something which is original, not existing before. Um, it, as I said, Berne Convention was made in uh, more than 100 years ago, way before even computer existed. So why, how can it protect software? Software is protected as a literary work. So if you, if you think of the source code, source code is basic, uh, something that resembles English language, roughly. So that is the basic protection of, of copyright. Uh, but unlike a writing, unlike a picture, and unlike a movie or statue or building, it has an utilitarian value. It is not protected, it is not valuable because it's uh, enjoyable, pleasant, uh, and whatever, or inspirational or informative, but it's, it's important because it does things. It, it instructs the machine to do certain things in, in a more or less efficient way. So this is a, uh, is halfway between something creative and something which is uh, useful. So that is a, a, a one obstacle to, to porting the concept of copyright to software, because software is not a writing in itself. It's something that does things. Uh, this is uh, another very infor important uh, information. Copyright protects only the part which is creative, which is not dictated. It's a, an original idea, which is unnecessary. If you, by external constraints, are forced to, to write code in a, a certain way, uh, and you have very little uh, room for maneuvering, there, that's not copyright because that's a fact. And facts are not protected. It's the form of expression which is protected. And the idea is not protected. It's not how do I do something, but how I write bit by bit, that's, that's protected, okay? So if I have a, a, a programming, I take inspiration and say, oh, I want to do the same thing, doing roughly the same th stuff. I, uh, for, for instance, I take Word, Microsoft Word, and I want to do a functional clone of it, I am permitted because the copyright protects the source code, doesn't protect the way things are done. That, that they don't protect the idea behind it. Only the original form of expression. Okay, so I can take inspiration to another comp uh, program, replicate it. It's used. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Windows API have been reproduced because they are a fact, are 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 not a, a an original form of, uh, of expression. So there, there's a, the, the final, the final uh, principle. The more uh, uh, copyright only exists when I have many ways to do the same thing, many ways to, to express myself. For instance, a recipe, a cooking recipe, that's the idea. The way I write the ingredients starts being a copyright. But the, the, the grams, the, the, the liters, these are not protectable because that it's Conversely, the way of another right that insists on copyright as well in certain countries, which is patents. Patents uh, uh, protect the idea. Copyright protects the form of expression. Patent protects an abstract idea. However, I implement them. If the concept is the same, that's protected. This is why I and many think believe that software don't, don't belong or to patents, or patents don't belong in, 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 in software. 
Uh, one of the consequences of having uh, patents is that you can uh, violate a patent uh, without even knowing the existence of a patent because protecting the general idea, many can come to the same conclusion. Actually, it happens that many come to the same conclusion at the same time and are uh, maybe a month apart with the same concept unknown to each other. So violating copyright is difficult. You must copy. You must look into or disassemble and copy. To, to violate a patent is very easy because you don't even know that you are trespassing on somebody other than that. So this is, this is a general concept that must be taken into the consideration. Um, so you have created uh, a new artifact, software, which is original, never existed before. Who owns it? So the general rule is that the author, i.e. this physical person writing actually the software, becomes the author, is the author, and becomes the owner in principle. Um, of course, you, you become the owner. You can, it's, it's, a, it's a tradable. It's, some, it's something that can be given onto others, can be passed, sold, leased, and everything. So you can assign the software to others. But there, is an, uh, there are two exp main exceptions to this principle. If you uh, work for some, somebody else, you are an employee, your employer, as a rule, is the owner. Of course, you can have different arrangements, but this is a general rule. If you work for CERN, uh, and in your job description is making software, your software belongs to your employer. Uh, the second exception, which is general and not so, uh, so clean cut, work for hire. If you are paid for making software and there is nothing in your contract, by and large, you must assume that your software belongs to who pays. So who pays gets, you know, no, not just the artifact, not just the software in itself, but the copyright on the software, which is a, a, something that needs to be fine-tuned. The ownership on software can be can belong to many because they have written them it together or because somebody has made addition. So uh, in open source especially, you get many, you have, especially in public projects, you have many people contributing, polling requests, merge requests, or patching software, or providing pieces, or taking care of a single area of software while others are, co are concentrating on others. So they make a, 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 a whole. So if you can identify single pieces, those single pieces are belonging to the author. But if you make many additions, which are not discernible one to the other, you have joint ownership. And joint ownership is a complication because it's a, it's a common good. So uh, the decision, decision must be made by everybody. So this is why in, in, uh, in, in some projects, relicensing is, is, is complex because if you have distributed copyright, but so many people, for instance, in Linux, probably the most known worldwide piece of, of, of open source software, uh, probably you have thousands, thousand people jointly, or maybe tens of thousand people jointly owning uh, something on, on Linux. So making a decision requires each and every bit of the software being uh, relicensed. And that means that if something says no, either you don't do anything or remove that piece and redo it over and again. Of course, this means that you can to trace who has made things, which is a, a computational problem in itself. Um, on the far end of the copyright is public domain. Public domain is very difficult to achieve. Public domain means that no one has rights. No one has copyright. How can this be achieved? Uh, you can try to waive your copyright. But in many countries, and I think Switzerland is one of these, for sure Italy, for sure Germany. Uh, sorry, too, much, too fast. Uh, getting rid of copyright is very difficult. It's almost impossible. But this is the, the idea. And of course, after, after 70, uh, your death plus 70 years, that copyright expires. 
Uh, and we can say that public domain is a, is a form of open source. Can, it's, it's, non, it's unencumbered by any, any rights. So you can take and put it into, into a, a, project, a software project. So this is the general framework. A, you have software, and this software becomes subject to copyright. You have to do something to make it available to others. It's not sufficient to just share. Share is not sufficient. We come to that in a second. So you need to, to step onto licensing. Uh, as I said, you don't have to do anything to get copyright. You have to do something to make it available. And this something is to give a permission, a grant. You must, you must do something in a legal realm in order to give this permission to others. And in open source, this, these others are everybody, potentially even people who are, who are not born yet. Uh, and this permission is what we call license. License is a legal deed, is a contract, is a, an agreement, but it's a public one. So we call it uh, deed because it's something unilateral, is a promise to everybody, is a, a deed open to everybody. So it's not I promise to you or I promise to everybody. And this permission has conditions. Has, it's not just, oh, do whatever you want. There are licenses called do whatever you want, but these are very, very special. Most of them, they say, oh, you can do this, but you should, you must, okay? And these you do, you must, are called conditions. So license means permission, permission is conditioned. So uh, uh, this works in copyright because this doesn't need to be a contract. Because either you have the permission and you only have the permission if you comply with the condition or you don't have anything. So suppose that the, the deed is null and void, is not workable. Fine, you don't have permission. So you get back to the original state that everything is reserved. So if the, if the condition is complying, that you can do certain things. If your condition are not complied with, then you have no permission. Even if one condition is not complied with, you don't, end up, you don't have the permission. Of course, uh, technically, it's, uh, law is not like computer, uh, computer science, it's not perfect, it's not scientific language. So uh, you must rigorous in your writing, and this is still not enough. So th this is why general message never write a license unless there is a special motive and you have a special itch and you want to scratch this itch, but it must be something very huge. Otherwise, always reuse existing licenses and always reuse licenses which are approved by the OSI, sorry, conflict of interest, and second, which are the most popular. There are, there are more than 100 licenses approved by OSI only I advise to use tops 10 of them. No more. And 10 is even a large number. I would start, uh, go down to five. Anyway, this is just a parenthesis. We can, we can do that later. Derivatives. Here, so we have a license, we have a copyright, we have a, an, an artifact, we have a but we don't have all the, the tools to, to manage the concept because this is the most important tool today. Because license, what the license cover and what the license require all depends on understanding what a derivative is. Unfortunately, derivatives is, a, is, a, is very uh, uh, dodgy issue. Nobody agrees on what uh, derivatives is. But suppose in, the, in, in, a, in, a general, in a general idea you write software because uh, you start over. Nobody today does it uh, from scratch. And unless in very special cases, maybe at CERN here, you do a lot of this, but many times you, you reuse in some, some way libraries, snippets, uh, original ideas, a project you find, you elaborate. So. So if anything above a certain complexity, no way, it's a derivative or something else. Libraries, of course, it's a, it's a case. So uh, 
this is by and large a technical issue, but from the software and the copyright, it, it doesn't make much difference. So if you, for instance, if you have a library and this library is linked statically, that creates an artifact which contains physically, so it's uh, like you pay, put many pages together in, in a binder, that's it for sure a derivative. There is no way to escape. That's it, 100% uh, uh, original uh, copyright concept. In software, we have other uh, ways of combining software, like put having a, uh, a DLL or importing uh, libraries only at runtime. So the, the objects you distribute are separate objects, but functionally they are linked together. And, and at the runtime, they use uh, areas of memory, instructions, functions, calls, special calls. So they are one functional unity, only dispersed into many in a single file. So the fact that it's, this is a, a common misconcept, uh, dynamically linked software create derivatives. Uh, so, uh, but it's not clear where, where the, the boundary is. Here, everything is included. Here, mm, you ask 20 different people, they gave you 20 different, uh, per, uh, different answers, and it's all, uh, also very uh, language dependent. So in Java, uh, hereditarity is different from C, it's different from Python, it's different from Go, you name it. So uh, you must, uh, a lawyer or a judge, in order to say, uh, to tell whether something is a derivative or not, they must understand this concept, which means they need, must learn programming. I had to learn programming. I'm not much of a programmer, but I had to learn it to understand deeply, because otherwise there is no. Maybe if you do software, you can understand better. Uh, and this part is still doesn't doesn't relate necessarily to open source. This is true for all software. Of course, with proprietary software, you don't have much access to source code, so it's more rare to, that you have to discuss this. But it happens. So software, also in proprietary software, source code circulates under NDA, or maybe it's just published, just in case, without, but, without, but without a, a free software license. So uh, from a copyright perspective, there's no cha no no no, uh, no distinction. So it's a, using a derivative without permission is uh, a violation of the copyright in the original uh, software. So. Original software, derivative, software you control, not only the software, but also the derivatives, because the derivatives contain. So this is something to which copyright extends. And you can also face criminal cha charges in Italy if you violate copyright, in some case. Why derivatives are very important in in open source, because we have this very important copyleft concept. Copyleft. Uh, you might have heard that certain licenses are uh, viral or infectious or a cancer, but that's, that's another thing. Uh, this is bullshit. There is no virality, but there is a fact that uh, copyright controls derivatives, and if you have a derivative, uh, you must have a permission to make these derivatives. But sometimes, uh, certain licenses have a special requirement, a special condition, not just you have to acknowledge my authorship, you have to ship uh, uh, the license text, you must... Uh, uh, accept that I'm not uh, uh, liable if anything, has, uh, which is very permissive licenses. Certain licenses have, have a special um, conditions. The condition is that all derivatives are under the same or compatible, the same or compatible license. For instance, if you have a cop a, uh, the, the copyleft uh, license, uh, the most famous is the new GPL, general public license. If you make a derivative 
of a license, which means that you extend the software or you use it as a library in another software, and it's GPL. It can be GPL v2 or v2 or any later version. You must distribute the, the larger work under the same license, GPL v2, or compatible GPU, uh, GPL v3, because uh, it, it permits to, to, to be on the same uh, on the same uh, on the same or compatible license and GPL v3 through this or any later version is made compatible because otherwise it will be incompatible. Uh, depending on how far reaching this requirement is, you have strong copyleft or weak or lesser copyleft. Okay, so when you have a license in front, the first question is: Is it copyleft? Is it weak copyleft, or is it, is it non-copyleft or permissive? So a permissive is, just, is a residual category. They have no requirements on derivatives. As long as the original set of software is, re remains on the same license, the rest, even, even modification to the same file, can be whatever. And it happens. There are many of these licenses. In weak copyleft, only the file at file level. So if you extend the library, that deck extension must be uh, must be in the same license. But you can use this library to make a larger work that calls upon this library, and this can be of any different license, okay, including including proprietary. In strong copyleft, everything to the maximum extent that you can claim this is a derivative of my work that. That far N includes and must be licensed under the same or compatible license. So copyleft is one of the most important characteristics of a license, and it tells different realm of licenses. they completely different game. Apache, MIT, BSD, Academic, they are all permissive. Uh, LGPL, MPL, Mozilla are weak copyleft, and GNU GPL, and a Ferro GPL, they are strong copyleft. So this is this is very important. So this is a, a recap. I can skip because we are uh, there is a lot of uh, fish to fry again. So uh, in the in the general scenario, what you do? You take some code because you don't start from scratch. It starts from scratch. This code. Has conditions, so you must take, see, look whether these conditions, what these conditions are, what the license is. This is not not very simple, because eh? this is not immediate. Uh, uh, in practice, this is uh, something that uh, n requires uh, to know where to look in a Git, uh, Git uh, GitHub repository. Usually, it's in copying or license. But it not maybe you have many uh, many direct many many folders down down uh, down the tree, and maybe those folders have different licenses too. So it's it's not that easy. So suppose you find all the conditions, all the licenses under which your software, the software you are using, is licensed under. The conditions of this part, we call it inbound. So this is in the inbound software, the software you embark in your project. And you have to decide what your, your project is licensed on, under. And this is called the outbound, because you are distributed onto others. Others would have this as inbound, and so on and so forth. There's a chain. So inbound, anything that goes in, outbound, anything that goes well out. And you have to take into consideration that everything that you, which is inbound is a derivative. And what you are doing is probably a derivative of this software. So you need to comply with uh, the requirements. And complying brings compliance, which is uh, uh, the uh, stay within the rules. Okay, Compliance means not just complying, but also means respecting, of course. Somebody is giving something to you under free conditions without, without any monetary uh, requirements, so you don't have to pay anything for very valuable software. You respect this decision by not 
uh, trying to circumvene the requirements. Uh, it, uh, this is moral, but in the legal, since we have a strong enforcement uh, uh, legal environment, you must uh, comply with. There's no alternatives. Uh, you can you can stay uh, stealth. You're not caught, but you are doing something which is not legal. Okay, even if it's everything is free, everything is very cool about using software. So uh, and. If you have strong copyleft, uh, you have many more conditions. So it's harder to implement uh, st strong copyleft in your project because, well, <laughs> the requirements are higher. The higher the requirements, the harder it is. But this is this is uh, something very important that uh, many misunderstand. Uh, these requirements are to be complied with. Most of the time, 99.99 per times uh, percent of the time, uh, you need to comply only when you distribute it. So, if you take some project and you use it in your laboratory, and you don't do any distribution, you are home free. You can do whatever you want, roughly. So, the on the only. Uh, uh, the only case is when you publish uh, uh, a GPL, uh, a Afero uh, GPL software in a, in a software service fashion, then you have some some regard. But otherwise, unless you distribute this software, you are home free. Of course, if you're doing scientific projects and you have to publish the source code of your project, that is an act of distribution, and that is also. But fortunately, if you only pr uh, distribute the source code, um, a source code you can publish it separately. Okay. When you, uh, you distribute a build, I mean object code or uh, byte code or whatever, then you have the, to face this problem. So it's better uh, any time you start a new project, it's better to take these concepts and uh, have these concepts very clear and have to do the, the right decisions from the outset. This must not be an afterthought. This must be thought through from the inception, because there are many things that can go wrong. And if a project is successful and it lasts many years, it must keep on with uh, keep up with the evolution of the upstream software. So uh, these conditions can change over time. So you must make sure that uh, uh, you you rely on reliable. Uh, upstream software. Um, these are the areas when pe where people fall, where, you know, where people stumble upon, because it's, these are the main areas of compliance. The first and very, very common area of, of, uh, of non-compliance is not distributing the entire source code. I mean, they modify, sorry, sorry, too, too much. Uh, the entire source code. And th this includes not just the source code per se, but also the installation instruction in many cases. So if you have a non uh, software for a non-standard platform, st platform which is not a PC, but is an embedded software or is a special machinery and with a different tool chain to, to, to build, you also have to make sure that everything is distributed, including the tool chain. This is why compliance in the abandoned world is much different because you have to do cross compilation. So you have to, to basically to give the entire compilation set, the completion machine, which is not uh, uh, self evident. And this falls in, in, into the entire source code because without a source code, somebody else cannot uh, benefit from the, uh, the liberties that open source uh, delivers. So, uh, so copy, especially copyleft licenses, strong copyleft, weak copyleft, doesn't matter, require that you ship with any distribution you ship, uh, ship in, um, um, it's, uh, by uh, a very large uh, meaning of the word, but you ship also the source, the course, full corresponding source code. And uh, sometimes you can just make it available through an online, uh, sometimes you have to ship it with the object, sometimes you can make a promise to deliver the complete source code uh, for three years. For this, this is the, 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 the GNU GPL for three years uh, without any charge and so. So this is this is 
course, uh, the, the most, the most uh, sometimes difficult and, and the most disregarded uh, uh, obligation or, or condition. Provide the attribution, all, virtually all the licenses, including the most liberal, require that you give some kind of attribution when you distribute code containing this. And this code can be uh, mingled with many other sources, and so it's difficult to trace. Maybe there is an MIT or a BSD piece of software which has been transformed, and, and somebody in the chain has forgotten to, to include the attribution, and this is a violation of the original code. Because it make, maybe this is something, is a low-level network things that Microsoft has taken and make it and something, oh, this is my software. I have, yeah, I have published it in 1984. And say, wow, it's still copyrighted, and it's still there, maybe low level and hidden. So this uh, is something that can be tricky, because people think, oh, it's, it's liberal. I don't have to do. I can never no. You, have, you can have, do whatever you want, but provided you give attribution. Notice the same. Uh, accompany the, the work with the, with the license, because maybe this license is not public, or maybe you want to make sure that people receiving the artifact knows what the conditions are. But, last but not least, combining incompatible licenses. This is the essence of copyleft. Copyleft requires you to distribute your outbound software with a, an outbound, a precise outbound um, license. So, it, it can happen that you uh, one say uh, license A says you have to distribute everything under license A. You combine with the license B saying that you everything which is a derivative uh, must be under the same uh, the license B, you combine the software and you have an alternative. Either you comply with one and violate the other or the other way around. Unless the, one of them has a compatibility uh, provision, which is not very uh, very uh, very rare, but still. So you can end up with an impossible combination, so you cannot distribute the same. So either you have to ask for a special permission, you go upstream, say, ask for a permission, or you, you do another a different software selection. And this is what I was saying. So. Uh, you have incompatible, so maybe even even not just a license under the same conditions provision, but it can be uh, uh, everything must be litigated in New York, and the others say everything must be litigated in London. This is why I say never put a, a, a venue choice of venue in, in license. That's another, another but can be a very hidden conditions that are incompatible, because they too are impossible to comply with uh, at the same time. So there are many licenses which are incompatible. And in, but in no way you can, you can comply with. And the, the, uh, to make things even more complex, it's not to, just one way. So you have outbound compatibil incompatibility. So some software that cannot be included in, in a project with a, a, a uh, sorry, uh, the outbound say, I can reuse this software. But one of these licenses says, no, I cannot mingle with those other people. I must stay alone or only with my kin. So this is a, a project which is not compatible because the inbound license doesn't, doesn't accept to be included in a larger work and to be licensed in an artifact which is in, with an, uh, uh, the license, the outbound license could be, oh, I'm, I'm totally fine, but it's the inbound. So you are viol violating this license by including this project in this other license. Or the other way around, the other way around is uh, uh, you use maybe very liberal licenses, but they are incompatible because the outbound license says, oh, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like these guys coming into my house. So you cannot. So you have to combine the requirements of the inbound, the existing software, and the license of the outbound because by putting things together, you are mixing and distributing under a general license. They cover all this derivative, which include parts which are not yours. So 
It's, uh, it's more complex that you say, oh, the, my license is compatible with, but uh, the other license can be incompatible with yours. So uh, sometimes, and I've, I've litigated that in court. Uh, judge uh, and the other parties, uh, which was uh, in public administration in Italy, huh? they say, oh, but you go to the UPL, they say it's compatible with GPL, so I can, I can use GPL put it into my board. No, you can put UPL into in a GPL and ship as a GPL, but you cannot take a GPL into an UPL and ship as a an UPL because it's, it's a two-way road and, and, and the two ways must be clear. If, if it's one way, you can do only in one sense. So you can only take UPL and through some changes that the some compatibility is too, too complex, you can include EUPL or MPL, Mozilla, into a GPL, but not a, a GPL uh, item into a Mozilla license. So when you get to strong copyleft, it's a pyramid. So many are compatible inbound, but one year at the top, nothing is compatible outbound, Un unless GPL or a compatible license expressly uh, mentioned in the, in the license. So these are the kind of things, and, and this is just two pieces of course. Uh, many projects have like uh, 20, 30 projects which are a dependency. So finding the dependency, finding um, what license they are licensed under, and um, making a matrix saying every, is everything complied because that does not. This is just very simple interface, but this can be tricky. Can be an API, can be a non-API, can be a library. It can be a, many things. So it becomes very complex. We have a complex tree of dependency of the very very simple artifacts, which uh, well 2025 different libraries. Not easy to solve. So uh, you need to find uh, some information on where, uh, if, if a license is compatible with another, uh, it's very difficult to find one. This is very reliable, but this is only work for GPL, which is not a bad idea because GPL is the most famous, the most uh, used uh, strong copyleft. So it's the most picky and the most valuable. So other cases are corner cases. This is a very important and frequent cases. And of course you, have no, you don't have only one GPL, you have two GPL, one LG, two LGPL, and even one affair GPL, so, uh, which are weak or strong cobbler. So um, this, is, uh, this is very, very, very good. It, maybe it's a little bit too picky. Sometimes the, the, the choice they made are too safe but at least you have something safe, and if you want to take risk, you can, but at least you know where to start. Uh, you say, oh, well, how, li well, how likely is that I get in trouble because of this? Fun fact, the, uh, the cases litigated are very few, but are increasingly many, plus, you, d you know of certain cases, you don't know of many other cases where people come and knock at your door and you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I quit, whatever, I take everything down. So, to, so many cases are, are dealt with behind doors. So, uh, so in, in, in many cases, you, do, you don't know of them, but people are struggling with suffering. Sometimes you, I have a friend with a small project, interoperability project with a, a smartwatch. Um, they, had, they were taken down under the US DMCA, so their project was shut down by GitHub without a prior notification, without any, and that was a case of uh, incompatibility. So uh, it's, uh, it's not likely that you face problems in court, but problem non problems nonetheless. So it can it can be a a it can be a stumbling block. So what what you need to do? So these are the pitfalls. So what you need to do in order to uh, make a project r running smoothly, uh, selecting the software wisely. So finding what the license is. Uh, analy uh, an, an analysis of what the, li the upstream licenses, the inbound licenses are. So that me means mapping dependencies. Sometimes the dependencies is not a true one, so you can get rid of the part. Uh, using tools to analyze and 
this is uh, to have a process. So this is something that you don't know just when the project is read the ship and say, oh, oh, by the way, uh, compliance. No, no, you have to do it from the outset, from the start. Otherwise, it's a complete mess. And maybe you have to redo many things, and it's not a wise idea. Especially if this is uh, in something that goes into production in, in, uh, in numbers. Uh, the information is available, but sometimes even the project don't know how to properly uh, uh, notify how the, what the licenses are. Um, but there are ways, there are technical ways, standards, a good practice or good practices in order to make it, this clear and machine readable. Uh, up to uh, uh, above a, a certain scale, uh, doing it by hand is virtually impossible. You have to rely on machine f stuff uh, going going on. Uh, you can use code scanning uh, in, onto into different ways to to find snippets that have been reused by something not doing their job properly, or this is very very popular. They use scanners to process natural language to say to, to look what the license choice of the original author was, which is insane, because in a software in a software project everything should be machine readable. Um, so it's uh, it's 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 uh, in order to be a good citizen, it's not a requirement, but in order to be a good citizen, you should be put this information in a machine readable form, and. Uh, Relying on scanning is like putting together pieces of a broken jar when the jar is broken. It's not a good idea. So we have we have standards. This is open chain as a standard for complex uh, production environment. I, I'm not digging into because we're, we're all running late, but this is something you have to, to, to take into consideration. It's a holistic. It's not just for software, but the entire organization to face inquiries, uh, to, uh, to have documentation of the process, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of things. Uh, this is much, is much easier. It's another standard. is software package distribution interchange, which is a set of, of machine-readable information, which says, uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, the dependency, uh, the author, the owner, and the license under which this artifact is. And this is a very important. SPDX is a unique identifier of it has a unique identifiers of licenses and derivatives and special so you can put that and a machine a machine can learn uh, what the license is on a given artifact you can you can slap this on on a, in a header of the file or you can apply to a number of files um, there is there's another there, I'm, I'm not sure I've mentioned it there is another uh, uh, way of making sure that each and every single file is correctly attributed and correctly uh, licensed which is called reuse like the work it's uh, it's a free software foundation uh, foundation Europe's uh, project it's called uh, the the link is not here I forgot to, to include it it's uh, reuse.software you can, and it's, it's a way, it's, if you know Debian, it's roughly the same concept of Deb, Deb 5, so the, the, the way uh, Debian does this. So these are things you do or don't. Huh? It's, a, it's a, quick, a quick list, we're almost done. Uh, select upstream, don't assume, don't just rely on what people do, because people make mistakes even with their own, maybe they haven't done uh, a proper job. Uh, uh, oh, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't don't write licenses. That cannot be stressed enough. I'm 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 aboard OSI. OSI is is vetting. It's approving licenses, and we uh, receive so many stupid uh, submissions of people just redoing the same stuff, but just but change the comma. That's totally rubbish. But yeah, uh, compatible. But we. Uh, by all means, try to be uh, to avoid that. 
Uh, don't, 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 don't just follow, don't be a sheep, don't just follow others because every time everybody's doing this must be true. No, many do wrong stuff. Um, very, very few uh, run into problems, but if you run into problems, you are alone. There is no, no comfort in having others in the same situation because that's, that's you. Uh, oh, so that's, that's for, for projects. Uh, use, reuse, that's the, the project I was mentioning before. I'm sorry, no, I don't have the. Uh, use SPDX because all the information on licenses, all information of what license your project is, all information of what you reuse or what your software depends on, if maybe you're not distributing the same software, but make it sure it's machine readable because that makes my life easier, the, the project, even small projects' uh, life easier. Don't rely on scanning. Scanning are very good, but they are just uh, it's like the airbag in a car. Maybe you don't get killed if you have an accident, but it's not wise to crash onto a wall anyway. Uh, uh, but this, this is just something that uh, if you have an, a compliance office, rely on any, any doubt you have to a compliance officer if you have in your structure. Uh, and try never to use uh, software under license which are not approved, not just by license, but not approved by OSI. Even OSI licenses, there is a lot of rubbish in there, so try to use the very most, uh, few most popular, as I say, 10 tops, maybe 15. CERN has five or four or five different licenses. One is approved by OSI, so they are doing a great job. I have contributed to the open hardware, the version one, then they have made the second version more, more. but CERN is a special case. So they, they have special requirements. So it's good to have them on board. So uh, we are just five minutes ahead of schedule. No, ahead of schedule. Uh, uh, I have uh, very, there's a question in the background. Yeah. Hello, first of all, thanks for the interesting lecture. Uh, when you read licenses of some softwares, they sometimes state like for personal use, for commercial use, etc. Uh, in this context, what are what is CERN? Are we commercial use? All right. Um, this is uh, uh, the definition of of open source is an open source definition. Um, there's another definition which is also useful, which are the full freedoms of the software. And special uses, special usage is not open source, it's not free software. Because uh, to, in order to be open source, in order to be uh, free software, software must have no field of endeavor uh, restrictions, no discriminations on who, public, private, for business, for non-business, Italian, European, no, this is rubbish. Uh, in order to, for software to be open source, there must be no restrictions on the field of endeavor, field of use. So this is for commercial use, may be a very good software, may be a good license, but it's not open source, okay? And um, one thing I, men I mentioned patents, you can not even say, oh, this is uh, for you, a free to you, for, uh, but only under copyright, but not under patents, which I own. This is not open source. Because open source is a, is a mean to an end. The end is software freedoms. The, the end is everybody can be able, without permission, to do what they want wh while complying with the conditions. But this is important. If you say, uh, you're free to do this, but you have a chain uh, somewhere, you're not free. You cannot go. So if you, if you have to ask permission, this is not free. So open source is a permissionless, frictionless legal system for being sure that you can reuse the software. Anytime this is restricted, you're not free, and this is not open source. Wait, but there are many products that are open source, but they are not free. Like no, no, no. Docker is based no, no. on open source, but... No, 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 no. Okay. Free software and open source software are 100% the same practical thing, 
because the open source definition and the free software for liberties are one, uh, one is the operational way to spell the freedoms. So uh, free and open source are synonyms. Free as in freedom. You say free as in free beer, that's another thing. Free means meaning at no cost, okay, but free at no cost or is not open source. We say free, and unfortunately there's free uh, uh, conundrum in, in English. Gratis, at no cost, that's not open source. This is why, why open source was coined in the first place to, make, uh, to resolve this distinction. But we say free as in freedom, i.e. for liberties, is one thing. Free as no money, no payment, this is another thing. So, of course, you can, you can, requ you can require payment for distributing free software. Uh, that's a kind of intuitive. You can want, you can ask for payment to, to give uh, free and open source software unto others. But what you cannot do is say, you get the permission if you pay me. That is the, the, the limit. Uh, the, that is the, 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 uh, the threshold. If you, you, can, you can charge for giving software, for making software, for distribution software, and that's still open source. You cannot demand money for the permission. So the permission is given, and what is given is given for everything, for every. There are many licenses submitted which say, oh, uh, this is free for any legal thing. So they say, oh, that's, that's only for legal things, so you don't do illegal things, do you? Uh, so it's fine. No, it's not fine. First, it's open, it's free, you can be, use it for even committing crimes. Second, what is permitting, permitted here is not permitted 25 meters across the, the, the border. So uh, uh, insulting a person is legal in the States, is not legal in, in Switzerland. The same thing. Or uh, uh, criticizing the power is perfectly is required in a democratic. It's not is not permitted in non-democratic countries. So defining what is legal depends on the thing. So this is and this is why open source the 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 the, uh, the role of open source is creating a frictionless, permissioned, but uh, uh, sorry, permissionless uh, environment where the permission is given once. Forever, for any purpose, to everybody. If anything short of that is not open source, call it whatever you want, it's not open source. Okay, so my understanding is that uh, if a company makes products and they claim that it's uh, open source and they put conditions, then it's just publicly available code, but it's not open source. They are, they are cheating on you. They are using the bus of open source without paying the price of open source. Because there's a price in open source. It's not free, it's not uh, costless. It costs producing, it costs maintaining, it costs uh, complying, it costs on lawyers as well. So it costs and you give it for free. So uh, complying the conditions is a form of retributing the, the effort of giving software to you. Now, com companies investing billions of US dollars or euro or Swiss francs on to making software. There's software which uh, was be untenable for any co company, even the largest, even Google, even Microsoft, could not do Linux, and they don't. They contribute to Linux and put in a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of engineering, a lot of anything, and they require everything. So this is a, a contract, and this con is a social contract, and a contract must be respected. And one of these contracts is, uh, you know, uh, the rules of the road. So you know the rules from the inception. The rules are the software is open source, it's one of the rules, and the software is under condition. These are the other rules. But these rules must be clear from the inception. So how, if, if I look at the product and uh, the company claims it's open source, so how I make sure that it's actually open source and it's not they claiming it's being open source and not really being so? You have two, two things, two things. Uh, when we make open source, I mean, I mean, me, my clients, uh, we make two things. First, we publish the entire set 
of software in order it to make to be reproducible. So you can start from the same starting point and end up with the same output. The second thing, you have the right to take the software which is in the, in the, in the product and replace with your own builds. If you can do those th two things, you sure it's open source because you can change it. So this is why in, in the GPL, for instance, there is this anti tivoization clause, which makes sure that you don't have special keys or secret for the machine to be, to be running your own implementation of the software, your own build, or to make changes in the software. So if this is the golden rule. Sometimes there's people saying, I mean, uh, Android is based on open source. It's based on open source, it's not open source. So it's, it's a nuanced uh, situation. It's, uh, the, the boundaries are blurred, but the boundary you cannot say, you cannot trespass is the legal conditions. If there is an open source license, it might be open source. It should be. So if there is no open source license, it is definitely not an open source software. Thank you. Welcome. And the other, one yeah. in the back, uh, one in the back, and then you. Sorry, so open source pr uh, protects for the current version of the software because you grant a license to the current version and not to future version. Could you imagine a, you know, a, a legal place where a company sold you uh, open source software but then tells you, yeah, you have the right to distribute it, but if you ever distribute it, I will stop terminate my contract with you and not sell you the next version. Okay. So <laughs> it, it should require an entire lesson. So... You distribute an artifact and use lab license on that artifact. So the first bit, the last bit, anything in between is licensed under those conditions. Or it can be more patchy, but the concept is once, one, one file, one single file from the first bit to the last bit. That, that artifact is a, if you make a change and end, if you make a change and you are the sole copyright holder of the entire software, then you can say, now it's GPL, now it's proprietary. It happens all the time. It happens very frequently. No, it's but, very but common. I, but I mean, even without, send, uh, without, send, you know, without changing the, the license. You, are the cop uh, you cannot violate your own copyright. So uh, one point I stress very much to People doing open source, don't treat yourself as a special person. You, you treat yourself as if you were a member of the community. So, because if you want to have some, something to contribute, you don't put yourself in a special situation. If you are the sole copyright holder of the software, you can decide whatever you want. You can, you can license into, uh, re-license or stop distributing it. And so, but if you are a client, you have a recipient of the software and you have the source code, you can fork. This is the big liberty. You can, you can fork from it. You know, at this point, at this version, it was GPL v2. I keep on distributing the same. Of course, you're limited yeah. by the license, whereas the copyright holder is not. They can do many things on the top, but at least you have this very room for maneuvering. You can fork, but you might not have the expertise or the experience to maintain the new version. This is not a perfect word, but you can learn. And there is no legal barrier, and there is no informational barrier to that. Because you have the source code, you have the technical ability, in theory. You have the legal ability to do that, the permission. These are the two things you have in open source, which you don't have in a proprietary. Of course, nothing is perfect, but this is, you know that at a certain point you are, don't require any permission to take the development from, development from then onwards. And as I said, yes, a company holding the entire copyright can do that, but in some projects this is not true anymore. In Linux, this is not true. Why these companies? No single company has sufficient power to replace the work done so they must, they must contribute, because this is the game, the game works. Because uh, it's, it's, it, you rely on the self-interest of the person not uh, to, to contribute and to not be caught cheating. Because the, this, um, the game is, uh, don't uh, like cheating very much and it's quite uh, costly to try and distributing. I mean, IBM, like uh, 15 years ago, uh, 
was hit by a, a litigation by SEO, is a dead company, a SCO, SEO, uh, a Unix maker, and they claimed they had some, some bits of, of code inside and they, or they couldn't distribute Linux. That's, uh, it was a, so multiply, the, and they paid millions just to litigate this case, which was bollocks. Huh? They paid millions. Uh, multiply this thousand times. It's untenable. So, uh, true op uh, open source is a is a spectrum. You have public, very open. Uh, everything is open. Um, Multi-stakeholders, no one single concentration, no silos development. You say you, you go to Eclipse Foundation. I'm a member of Eclipse Foundation. They have a strict policy to everything in the open, everything very clear, and no single stakeholder. The project must have do one, two, three main contributor because distributed copyright is a guarantee for on uh, long-term sustainability. Uh, conversely, Oracle, it's open source, it's the same, uh, MySQL or uh, open office, no, now it's, now it's dead. The uh, silos development on assignment, some concentration, uh, they can change the license as they want. Yes, open source, license is good, the source code is there but you don't trust them ultimately. They can change their mind. And it, if it's in their interest, you know they change their mind and, and you don't rely on it. So this is, uh, I'm speaking about the legal concept. This is a more social and reliability. And it's, that counts as a consequence of the conditions. So my, my question is more about uh, ownership and authorships, which mm. are not quite, I'm not sure that I agree clearly understand it, so I have three situations pop out of my mind where, where it's not clear who's owning and who's the author of what's remaining. So the first situation is I'm, I'm participating into an open source um, repository mm -hmm. and I've refactored everything in a function. Who's the owner, who's the author of this function? Because the first ID, the first implementation was one person and then the second person have rewrote everything. I don't know who's owning the bit of code. Okay. The second situation is uh, usually when you start your uh, repository at the very beginning of your new libraries, you're creating, creating your license file, you're creating it via GitHub using OSI approved licensing mm -hmm. and you put your name. So there's one single name in the copyright ownership file mm -hmm. and what you explained at the beginning was that every people that have participated mm -hmm. in the code have ownership in this situation. is. Is it the person that has wrote his name in the first place that has ownership on the repository or everyone that has participated in it? And the third situation is, I've started the library, it's working well, mm. I have ownership because I've, I've written mm. it, and then a company hires me to continue working on this library. Is the code that I'm producing afterward is still my code or is it my company mm. code? So that okay. are the three situations. Okay. <laughs> um, Author is a, a, an individual person writing the software. Um, it's not compulsory. It's not compulsory. I mean, it's not required by. Uh, it's a, a more the general distinction between moral rights and no moral rights. There are countries with moral rights, countries with no moral rights. Suppose we are in the United States. Mm -hmm. Copyright, pure copyright, not what at all. Here, we in France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Duodotor, they are, you cannot uh, waive your right to be acknowledged as the author. But suppose this is not, a, this is just a complication. Um, many projects don't, simply don't say who is the author. Or there is an arrangement for putting the author, as the author a company. This is counterintuitive. So uh, this simplifies things. So you can say, um, if somebody uh, wants to fork the software and to put it under their own control and contribute on the top, they must acknowledge your contribution. So your name must be there. And they can add whatever name they want. If they want to have to contribute to your project, so you're upstream to, their, to them, they make a pull request to you, and you accept and say, 
Uh, and maybe they say, but the condition for me to contribute is that you put my name under authorship. Mm. So if the contribution is sufficiently meaningful, you, I, I, I have received a very important uh, contribution to my script as a, a script to, to modify uh, the names in, 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 in the Word or LibreOffice papers for anonymization. I received very substantial contribution, and it was me putting the name of this guy on, on the header because that was the right thing to do. Um, so you can, you, you can, you can refuse. Mm -hmm. In, in the copyright system, you can refuse. Of course, the, the guy says, or the girl, or the whatever, they say, no, it's, it's not. Uh, uh, you must, or, or this, uh, you don't have permission. And it, since it's their authorship, it's their copyright, they have the right to require. And you cannot just put it if that is condition. Um, rewriting the software from scratch with. Um, so derivative, if you take something, you change, you add, that's still under your copyright. Mm -hmm. Until when? Until the modifications are so many that the original part is totally lost or become so diluted that it's not discernible. There are things, snippets, which don't amount to copyright. But it's a long way. Uh, the best way to make sure that there's no, uh, no original software in the other software is to start from scratch without even looking into the code and do just what what called white room development. Means that you read the code, you write the specs, in a, or you transform into another language, and somebody do the actual implementation from your specs, from your speaker, from your pseudocode into the original. So you are sure you, the software is not tainted. Okay. This is the word. Uh, if you look at the software, look at what decisions the author has made, you can be tainted by the software. So the only way to make sh absolutely sure there is no derivativeness is to rewrite it from scratch. Looking through a, f from distance, uh, for instance, LibreOffice Word, they had made, or oh, there is a famous, most famous case, it's called uh, Word Programming Services against SP, uh, uh, SAS Institute. It's the uh, uh, European Union Court of Justice deciding on, on uh, what you can do by looking into a program and try to make a functional code. Uh, as long as you don't reverse engineer in meaning you don't decompile the software and ascertain the source code, then you can observe, study what it writes, look at the, uh, at the script, the log, anything, what goes through the wires, look at the manual, you make the same thing, you make, make the same thing so that one uh, routine can be transformed 100% one, identical with own transformation, fully compatible, drop in replaceable, that's fine. That's fine. As long as you don't r look into the source code and you don't make the same code. Because copyright doesn't protect the way things are done. But actually, the, uh, the decisions, the creative decision you have made when you had choice. For instance, this is why interfaces are not copyrightable per se. Because faith interface is a fact, and you have the right to achieve interoperability. That's more or less true in the States, in Europe, and in other countries. So this is when. Uh, this is another question in you know, the, of you. Have, have I yeah, answered? We, we, we had a couple of questions in, in from, from Zoom, but okay, you can. Uh, okay, go one, on, then, go Zoom. Yeah, and then, then uh, Zoom. Okay. I'm here for the all day, so. Thank you, thank you I, for. I lock the doors, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I have water, you don't, you don't, so I can resist more than you. Yes, thank, thank you for the interesting uh, lecture, and thank you also for your generosity with the Q&A session. Uh, so I have um, uh, a question um, about the relationship between uh, free and open source software on one hand and uh, standard essential patents on the other side. So standard essential patents are patents which are absolutely required uh, in sure. order to implement a standard, right? Uh, you talked during your lecture about permissionless uh, uh, development uh, as a, a key feature of open source. Uh, so do you see the implementation uh, of, a, of, a, of a standard requiring standard essential patents as impossible using open source licenses or 
or is there a difference be between uh, uh, permissive licenses and uh, uh, copyleft licenses in that regard? Uh, the short answer is yes, I do. So it, it is impossible. Uh, there are people, and I can do name, uh, friends of mine, uh, m many of them, telling and uh, taking a different approach to say, no, 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 this is, uh, this is an, open, an open standard and you can do, of, of course, uh, uh, and, and even you have a, a reference implementation uh, in open source of the same standards, so it must be free. Uh, if you look at the license, and the license is uh, a carving out. I've, I know the game. I've tried to make it one. Uh, carving out patents. So uh, if, you, if you have to ask permission after the standard is made to, uh, by, uh, from somebody, that is not open source. Standard essential patents impose you to, for, to practice the standard, you have to practice the patents. That's, that's the, the deal. And if uh, either the, the permission is given to everybody without further uh, requirement, or without requirements, but requirements made in anticipation, and no, there is not permissionless. This is not open source. So uh, it's not a matter of permission of copyleft or non copyleft. That works in copyright. Doesn't work in, in patents. If you say you, you have the permission, but not under under patents, that's not open, open source. Full stop. Um, this is why I, I was very opposed to uh, one license uh, that has been approved, which is the W3C license, which is sort of agnostic. They say the license itself doesn't include patents, but we have a IPR policy. And as long as it, it works within W3C, it, they, it's complemented by the policy, it can work, but the license itself is not open source, in my opinion. And uh, there's another which uh, somebody tries to use, which is uh, CC0, Cop uh, uh, Creative Commons 0, which is a, something to create public domain. But they have a, a carving out provision for trademarks, which is fine, and patent, which is totally not fine. Totally not fine. So that's not open source. Okay. So. Um, if they say, they say uh, uh, standard, uh, open standard, they, they claim it, they are open standard, but if they cannot be implemented in open source, they're not open standards. And they say, oh, but you open source, your definition of open source. No, there's only one of the definition of open source, and which is permissionless environment. As soon as you put a permission, a required permission, it's not permissionless. It's not frictionless. I had to take steps and ask for permission to somebody. It's not open. Open is a synonym of permissionless. Not permissionless. The permission is granted one time forever up front. And this is the deal. There are. There are. Now, W3C is one. Uh, IEEE is starting to, to, to use this. Uh, Etsy is considering it. Um, um, there are standards. Um, uh, Alliance for Open Media is trying to to, to do the same for, for uh, uh, video, audio, video codecs. In audio, I, I have a special experience in audio video, uh, uh, H264, H265, uh, MPEG-2, MPEG-4, MP3, you name it. Um, the only way you can practice this patent in open source is to put a blob, a proprietary blob, on the top of a, an open source. Or do uh, the uh, VLC, for instance, they, uh, or FFmpeg, they have a, an implementation, but they are, by any definition of the, of the word, they are violating the patent. And, and I have clients using VLC, implementing in machine, they have been, uh, they have been hit with the claims, because that is software, uh, it's open source, but doesn't convey permission on the, on the patents. That's the deal. I mean, there might be people outside having patents, that's, uh, but they are not putting it into the standard. The, 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 the problem here, if they put the, they, they enter the standard and try to, to, to steer the standard to cover the patents so they have something to, 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 to monetize afterwards. 
there are others who are trying to swirl around patents in order not to trespass, and it's not very, it's very easy because nobody tells you what a patent is and what is the, the boundary. So it's, it's a complicated game. I'm trying to, to educate people on this. I've been at Etsy, I've been at Commission, I've been in many places trying to, I've been uh, in Brussels just a few months ago in order to convince people of what this is all about. Zoom. So Zuma has another question about Brussels uh, and how does the recent Cybersecurity Resilience Act proposal Ooh. by the EC uh, affect uh, open source licenses and compliance requirements, in particular the no liability clauses? Ah, yes, that's, that's a big problem. The, uh, commission is uh, is doing a set of new laws which are by and large very good decision for me a good uh, good policy but unfortunately they don't know the things that you already know because you have followed my you know what open source is okay um, they are listening to people who are whispering the same things that I say are rubbish and they s they try to uh, uh, to put a sort of a product liability clause into software. So if you publish software, you distribute software, you must uh, make sure that this is uh, safe. This doesn't have uh, insecurities. It doesn't convey a malware. All those sort of things. So this is a cyber resilience. This is a product liability. And so they say, okay. Uh, so if you distribute. Uh, this software, uh, you are distributing a product, so if you are a maker or distributor of a product, you're a maker or distributor of a software, you are liable. Uh, people said, oh, uh, what about open source? I say, oh, yeah, right, open source. I say, okay, but, and so they try to put some, some language in, in the, in the various clauses, in the recitals, so you know the the the, EU, the legislation are recitals and uh, and operative part. They put something to the effect of excluding uh, open source unless they are making it in a uh, for for business in a, in a business environment, which is sort of the kind of distinction you want to make, but there are many people contributing to op fully open source software, Eclipse is one example, and they are making money out of the software by providing. But uh, one thing is that I am Red Hat and I, I am worth 100 billion, uh, uh, and I make so I mean, uh, I distribute uh, Red Hat and it's true, it's, it's, it's okay that I am personally liable for the distribution I make. But if I am Red Hat, I am contributed to an Eclipse project, an IBM the way, the same, Google the same, and Oracle the same, uh, five for business. So this is, this is something which is not made for money. I mean, all, all, all contributors are making money, of course, and they are, should be liable, but the project per se shouldn't be. And this distinction, and where the liability is put is not very clear, not, cl not clean cut, and it can include many cases where um, uh, our true open source uh, products doing no, or no money at all or, or, or just the money for, for, for running the, the, the distribution, the, the, the development, but they are not supporting, they are not making money out of... of uh, of uh, licenses out of uh, of running the software, and they can be liable, which is unfair, and it could make uh, things worse because many companies will not contribute to these public projects anymore because they are fearing retribution, they are fearing liability. If anything happens, maybe they. So, uh, essentially, uh, you, the, the the deal is you get the source code. If there are insecurities, you can spot them. I try not to put them, but I cannot be liable for the 100 project upstream I have. So you do, you, you covet emptor. You should be making care you software you distribute to your clients is not, but not go upstream asking me for, for covering that. So, because I'm not making money and I'm not li liable for it. Uh, it, it, because this is strict liability, it, it doesn't require to be uh, uh, c c willful. It can be in innocent. It can take in liability from other projects, and it's not correct that I am liable for it. 
Okay, we have three minutes for a last question. That is, um, could you please comment more about the compatibility issues between EUPL and GPL? Ah, oh, uh, EUPL is a. Com uh, uh, it was made by the Commission, by the European Commission, for their own project. They didn't, didn't like to have a new as. Uh, license for their own project. And so they had their own set of license. And the UPL uh, realized that uh, because it's incompatible with uh, many licenses, uh, they said, but we want to cooperate. We want to be uh, a part of this uh, environment. So they put a compatibility clause. So they say, this software is UPL. But it can be put into a larger work, which is GPL, and we name the GPL, V2, V3, and we say, if this project is, is input into a, uh, a, G, a GPL uh, project, you can treat it as if it was GPL. For by all means, this becomes GPL, or LGPL, or Mozilla. But if you take it out, it it, is, uh, it becomes back a UPL. So, so it can be included into a GPL project. The GPL doesn't have this compatibility clause. So if you have a, a GPL library and a U, e UPL, you cannot put the, soft, the GPL software into UPL and to make it a e UPL. As much as you don't do that with Mozilla. Mozilla has a comp express compatibility uh, clause, and it can be made uh, GPL if it is included in a GPL product. But the, the, the opposite is not true. So it's not, you can put A into B, not B into A. That's uh, the, the best way I can have. There are nuances, there are special cases, there are corner cases, but this is by and large the, the idea. OK, I think. We are, oh, know, there's a final question. question. There's another question, yes. yes. You are between us and lunch. Could, could, could you use the mic? Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding how do you uh, make the distinction between, so, uh, let's say that we are working with a property, property, proprietary license and then uh -huh. you use, uh, for example, a library uh -huh. that it's under GPL. Okay. And so you have... Uh, either a derivative work or a combined work, whereas okay. the combined work uh -huh. um, is uh, defined as that there must be a strong separation between your own proprietary work and the, the, the GPL uh, library. So let's say that uh, my software um, basically has some formulas and uh, some um, interfaces in order to specifically work with that GPL library and not other GPL li mm. library. But I have not modified the GPL library. So my question is, um, can I, uh, should I make this available as GPL or can I still um, have uh, another okay. property? or another okay. open source license. No, the, question, the question is quite clear and is quite common, actually. And this is the, the area where many opinions differ. So you have as many opinions as the people you are asking to. My opinion is that the boundary between uh, derivatives and non-derivatives is not, as I said, is not in whether the, li the library is uh, statically or dynamically linked. Of course, this is a conditio sine qua non. If it's not uh, dynamically linked, it is a derivative for sure. If it's dynamically linked, and uh, you, uh, you must look uh, whether there is an abstraction between the two pieces. So you can play, take one library and replace it one, with a different library. Uh, only uh, well, and, and they can implement the same the same API and work. That's a plugin more more than else. Mm -hmm. And plugin can 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 fit the bill. But if you have a special uh, 
uh, set. Uh, if you have, uh, for instance, if you are calling function into the library and the library in the, the, the single function is supposed to some, some, some variables and you must follow these variables, maybe they are positional variables, that's just, that's just the same kind of, it's, that's, uh, you could have put the same software in the same file or as, as external, that's, that would be the same. It's, it's, there is no separation, there's not mm. abstraction. Whereas, um, if you have an abstraction layer and you can replace things in, in, independently or the same library can work in, in different environment, that's more akin to a, a, an aggregation of software that uses other software. For instance, every, 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 every Linux or Windows uh, executable software uses services from the kernel, of course. But they are well separated through a very well-defined abstract set of, of uh, so uh, you can replace the kernel with something else or mix and match or virtualize part. Uh, you know, there are many things here, and it works, it still works. That kind of separation doesn't make a, a, a Linux running application a derivative of Linux, okay? When you start with modules in the kernel space, that's more difficult. Sometimes you have, the, on the other side, you have hardware drivers, and they were made for SCO, or they were made for Solaris. And the same, the same are ported to Linux. It's difficult, it's difficult to say that they are derivative of Linux, or Linux is derivative of them, because they are, are placed, uh, they do the, exactly the same and to different under the two different that's that's the the, the the idea that these kind of device drivers are not the real don't make the real the combination of, of their of them uh in a loadable kernel module don't make a derivative uh as i said it's not science mm -hmm. you cannot you don't have a, a rule to say here one step further one step beyond you're free you're not free yeah it's a blurred uh, there is a, a huge discussion now, Oracle uh, versus Google for Android. They have reused the same library from Harmony, from, from, from Java, and it's very, very technical in nature. So it's, it's not easy to, 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 to tell uh, whether it's a derivative or non-derivative without looking at the code and what the code does. You can have clear cases and something very blurry in between. That's my word. That's the word of law lawyers. Okay, we have a really super last question from Maria. Yes. <laughs> then we Thank can... you so much. Really fascinating talk. Thanks. Uh, if it is too long, if you want, we can take it offline. But I give the elements of uh, some questions I have. Um, if somebody takes um, code generated by ChatGPT, puts it in a public GitHub okay. repo. Okay. Then what happens? Who is to, I mean, is there anybody to blame? I have a very tentative reply mm. answer. My answer is that uh, un except in very special conditions, uh, machine learning don't create derivativeness because they abstract the idea. It's very akin to what a human being does. They learn from many sources and they reprocess, reusing the same idea to make something new. Of course, once in a while, you can end up with exactly the same thing. Maybe you, you draw a picture or take a picture or draw a, 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 a sketch and they are almost identical, so much identical, or so much similar that a, a casual person can say, oh, you have copied. So, um, so um, the process per se creates something new. So the fact that I'm reusing copyrighted material doesn't mean that the result is a derivative, because copyright don't, uh, uh, don't control uh, the ideas it control the actual uh, form of expression. If I change the form of expression, if and if I express the same idea, or 
combination thereof, then I'm not making a derivative. Of course, uh, since it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a statistical statement, so there are cases which you end up by chance. Or maybe because the, the, the protocols, the, the machine, the filters are not efficient enough to create enough, or there is no enough entropy to, to, not create, to, to avoid creating a, a something too similar, and then you end up with something similar. In code, it's false. Uh, sometimes this lack of entropy is an indication that there is no corpora in there. So you must have a, a higher threshold for fine similarity. It's uh, are two sides of the same coin. So finding, finding, um, uh, copying is a statistical in nature. You say, how likely is that these people have come to the same conclusion without copying to each other? It's very, very unlikely they must have copied. But of course, one in a million is still one in a million. It's one. It's not zero. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a little bit fuzzy. So. Uh, yeah, just a quick correction to that. So you were considering before that you know, users are tainted if they ever read the codes. So they will be tainted, and then if you copy, if they produce new codes, you know, it will be derivative. So why isn't AI tainted in that case? It is tainted. This is precisely my, my so it is tainted. So it, 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 uh, they are facing the risk to be tainted. So they must make things in process not to be doing the same thing over and over. So, um, uh, usually, it's, it's a, it should be implemented, like, like I said, so something that learns, something that teaches, and someone that implements. If you have sufficient degrees of separation, this is, is computing science. I'm, I'm not a computing sci computer science, so take with a grain of salt. But if the machine learning is made sufficiently well, uh, they extract the idea and re-implement the idea without copying literally. So there is no snippets of code going to. They are making st things that are not reusing the same. So are mixing and matching and creating entropy. But even creating entropy and recreating the artifact and the artifact can, can end up very similar. So uh, you, you, you say, oh, it's very unlikely that these two are, are in copy. I know that process comprises at some point reading the ar actual artifact. So the burden of proof is on to you to say this is what everybody else, or, or very likely another, another uh, artificial intelligence or developer confronted with the same instruction would have ended up with the same code. How, is, how likely it is? Very likely, maybe a case in uh, the realm of possibility. Very unlikely, hmm, highly suspect. So you must have made something wrong in the process. Um, because it is, it is tainted. So tainted means that you have read it, it's not by chance because you have increased the chances. So having a different explanation that pure, sheer casuality. It's not, I'm not a statistician, uh, uh, not a mathematician, uh, I'm not a computer scientist, so I'm, I'm, I'm an amateur in this field, but this is the kind of indications. And I am, uh, I'm also on the other side of the, of, of the bench. I am claiming that sometimes people have copied from my client's software. So it's, uh, I, say, I see, there are things that cannot be by chance, errors, Errors are, 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 are not dictated by anything because they are errors. If you have say errors, comments, I see, I see common structures which are un, uh, oddities. I, th these are indicators of uh, something which went wrong. The, the, some, and plus, a, this is a qualitative analysis. Then I see how many lines are identical or very similar, or how uh, how is uh, the, the entropy has entered into 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 snippet software. There are algorithms to to study this. It's fascinating. There are algorithms studying uh, uh, the way to find similarities in snippets of code. Not in, of course, one file. It's it's very easy. But snippets of code, there are. <laughs> 
Uh, there's this. Uh, uh, Stefano, Stefano knows of, of this very, very. Stefano Zaccheroli. Uh, ask him. Ask him. So Stefano will be our speaker for Thursday. <laughs> so, so I would propose to, to stop here with the questions, and those who still have questions can join us for lunch in restaurant two now, so we can continue the discussion if uh, Carlo agrees. So I wanted to thank again Carlo for being here. And